We will support democracy from Asia to Africa, from the Americas to the Middle East, because our interests and our conscience compel us to act on behalf of those who long for freedom. And we must be a source of hope to the poor, the sick, the marginalized, the victims of prejudice, not out of mere charity, but because peace in our time requires the constant advance of those principles that our common creed describes tolerance and opportunity. The government in Ethiopia has become increasingly belligerent and bolder with its divisive ethnic system politics and policies. To date, the Tigray People's Liberation Front, or TPLF, continues to carry out intimidation, torture, abduction, imprisonment, massacres, ethnic cleansing, assassinations, and genocide. The following documentary will analyze the factors that are leading Ethiopia toward disintegration. It will examine the political, economic, and social aspects within Ethiopia and how they are controlled by a tyrannical government that is based on a single ethnic group. The government in Ethiopia has embraced a system that combines ethnocracy and plutocracy totalitarianism. Of that ethnic group, the rich are the apex of the system, where they continue to stretch and exploit Ethiopians to the benefit of themselves and their ethnic group. The ethnocratic aspect of the regime is seen in several sectors and institutions that are controlled and dominated by a single ethnic group, the Tigray ethnic group, that has continued to subjugate and oppress Ethiopians. This dominance by a single ethnic group is not subtle, but rather an open secret Ethiopians have known for the past 20 plus years. The plutocratic aspect of the regime is that many of those in power have built wealth by controlling and exploiting the sources of money that enter and leave the country. Whether those sources are federal foreign aid or the investments of private individuals, officials of the regime coerce, intimidate, and threaten investors with arrest if they do not get shares or derive some profit. For a number of years, Ethiopia has been consistently ranked among failed states. According to organizations such as Fund for Peace, Ethiopia has been included in the critical or warning categories of the Fund's Fragile States Index for the past several years. This is corroborated by the results of the long-term analysis of the U.S. National Intelligence Council, which placed Ethiopia among the 15 states that will become virtual failed states. Neighboring Somalia is the best example of a failed state in which everything has disintegrated because of years of inter-clan animosity and conflicts. The United States must take into consideration the obvious signs and immediately take action against the Tigray government or else usher in the inevitable disintegration of the country with its support, which in turn will present opportunities for terrorist groups to seize control. With the TPLF government in power, Ethiopia is heading toward a full-fledged terrorist state, and should the United States choose to support the government, it would run the risk of undermining its own interests. Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq, and Somalia can be cited as states in which terrorists have taken advantage of the disintegration by seizing the opportunity to launch and create hubs, and like these countries, Ethiopia could become a potential hub for terrorists when it disintegrates. If this is not immediately addressed, there's a high probability that Ethiopia might disintegrate. Ethiopia must democratize immediately, or it will become a failed state, much like Somalia, Syria, and Iraq. And it'll be ten times as chaotic because there are many different ethnic groups with different religions and political ideologies. In other words, unlike Syria and Iraq, where two or three ideologies are in competition, in the case of Ethiopia, it would mean at least a minimum of 10 ideologies with hundreds of armed groups fighting for their interests. To give a deeper perspective, the major points of conflict that can lead to disintegration will be presented. In addition, what Western countries, particularly the United States, can do to prevent Ethiopia from becoming a failed state will be discussed. Ethiopia has been in the top 10 recipients of U.S. aid for decades. According to the DAC, Ethiopia has been the fifth largest recipient of DAC donor humanitarian aid over the last 10 years, 
accounting for 19 billion U.S. dollars, or 23.5 percent of the total allocated to specific countries. According to Index Mundi, a website that collects data and statistics from multiple sources, in the past 20 years, the Tigray government has received an estimated 40 billion plus dollars in assistance. In 2008 alone, Ethiopia received 829 million in official development assistance, and in 2012, Ethiopia was the recipient of 707 million. Many of the funds given in the form of aid end up in two places. One is the Endowment Fund for the Rehabilitation of Tigray, or EFFORT. This corporation is the biggest corporation in terms of revenue and assets within Ethiopia. The other place is in offshore accounts kept in private banks in the names of children of TPLF politicians. In addition to ceasing funding, there must also be an investigation of effort. This can be confirmed by the Global Financial Integrity Report, which has stated that Ethiopia lost $11.7 billion in illicit financial outflows between 2000 and 2009. The so-called aid is funding genocide, torture, imprisonments, and ethnic cleansing. In 2013, the World Bank had attempted to hold an investigation on why its funding program, affecting thousands of people, relocated to make way for agriculture investors. There must be an investigation of assets owned by TPLF businesses within Western and Eastern Asian countries. Many of these assets are often placed in the names of their children so that they're not traceable to them. Throughout its 23 years in power, the Tigray regime has carried out several ethnic cleansings and genocides and continues to do so. It has carried out genocide on the Amara, Gambela, and Ogaden people, and in none of the genocides has the government acknowledged any wrongdoing. Since the early 1990s to the present, the Amaras have been cleansed from Guraferda, Shoa, Jijiga, Wolkait, Humera, Gambela, and many other areas. Hundreds of thousands of Amaras have been deliberately cleansed from various parts of the country under the orders of the Tigray government. As recently as September 2014, Amaras were still being cleansed from the south. The man responsible for the ethnic cleansing, particularly in the south, is Shekharao Shagute, who was at one point the governor of the southern regions, and through his own statements he has confirmed that the Amaras were subject to ethnic cleansing. The government has not been held accountable, nor has it acknowledged the killings. The Amara genocide has been largely ignored and uninvestigated. According to the Ethiopian census of 2007, the Amara population was 2.7 million people short of the projected numbers. While other ethnic groups were within, and some even over the projected growth, the Amara population did not show any growth at all. The confounding results were reported and ratified in Parliament. After several investigations, no one could understand why 2.7 million people were missing. In 2003, the Tigray government committed genocide against the Anyuak, killing 400 people and scattering thousands of people from their villages. The attacks were carried out among more than a dozen villages where women and children were victims of the attack. These are pictures of people from Gambela, Ethiopia. It was in response to what human rights organizations say was the government-led slaughter of hundreds of people from the Anyuak tribe in 2003. Today, there are still thousands of people who fled Gambela for Sudan, living in refugee sites. Many of the children are orphans. Some, who surviving Anyuak say, saw their parents killed before their eyes. The government had no reason to kill them because they never did anything. And the government just came in and killed men and boys and raped women and girls and that like that's what happened in
right. Eight soldiers surrounded my husband, repeatedly hitting him with their guns. And then Highlander militia started slashing him on his head, neck, and face. We're forced to collect bodies of dead Anuak in front of Gambela Secondary School. We we'll pick up bodies of four or five dead Anuak men. The military commander who was responsible for the genocide was Major Segaya Biena and Bernabas Gevreav, the Ethiopian federal minister who was responsible for Gambela State, stated that all reports of an Anuak genocide were fabrications and that it was a group of armed Anuak men who carried out the genocide. In 2007, the Tigray government once again carried out genocide, but this time against the Ogaden people in the towns of Fik, Kore, Gode, Wardahir, and Dahagabur. The government went from village to village, torturing, raping, and killing women and children. Look at my hand. These are bullet shots by the Ethiopian military. While I did not commit any crimes to deserve these, I was an innocent civilian. I have more bullet wounds on other parts of my body. This on my back is another wound. I was an innocent civilian, a camel herder. It was about 2 p.m. when they shot me in the head, but fortunately the bullet hit me through the side. Look at this long scar on my cheek. It is a gunshot wound, now healed. They left me as a dead body. The atrocities I suffered were uncountable. It is not something I can say consisted of such and such things. There was nothing they could do to us that they spared. I suffered the ultimate suffering. We were in a small town named Gurdumi in Dagabur province on February 15, 2009. When the army arrived, they started firing upon us indiscriminately and without asking any questions. It's the bullet that has done this to me. My teeth, mouth, all of this. It came in right here, went through my mouth and out here. They left me for dead. The people who were there were either killed, wounded, arrested, or fled for their lives. The dire situation that people are in is not something that can be described in words. Only those experienced it know. Here are some more stories of torture of Ogaden women in Ethiopia by Malez Zanawi's troops. They detained and divided us into different detention locations. Soldiers who attacked us were the federal police who came from Addis Ababa. The interrogators were also from Addis Ababa. I was in the central prison in Chigchiga with many other women. We had suffered continuous torture, rape, and strangulation. Soldiers put blankets on prisoners' heads with hot pepper chili smoke and rubbed it into their eyes. In some situations, they forced prisoners to drink salt water. They tied our legs with large wooden bars with heads down like bats. They used to throw us in water pools and suffocate us with plastic bags. They tortured men in shocking and inhumane methods. The regime's reason for massacring the people was in the interest of oil in the Abole region. The Tigray government had made deals with a Chinese petroleum company to exploit the area for oil, and so it was used as a rebel attack on the area as a pretense to carry out its genocide. Recently, an opposition media, Ethiopian Satellite Television, or ESAT, released a leaked video of a massacre of the Ogaden. In the video, several dead bodies are seen. One demo look as you stay, Yakal. Mm. 
ਸਰ ਬਿਰ ਵਲੋ ਸਾਉਟ ਦਾ ਸਾ ਖਨਾ ਸਾਉਟ ਦਾ ਖਨਾ ਸਾਉਟ ਦੇ ਦੋ 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 ਅੰਤੂ ਅਲਾ ਗੁਰੂ ਨਾ ਤੇ ਮੰਦੇ ਜੀ Many of those arrested were arrested under the bogus terrorism act that the government concocted to justify its imprisonments, tortures and harassments. Some prominent jailed journalists include Rayot Alemu, Eskinder Nega and Temeskin Desaling. These journalists have been recognized by the Committee to Protect Journalists or CPJ and have been awarded for their journalism. You no, know, it's only a, a matter of time before Rayot Alemu was sent to prison. Her country Ethiopia has become one of the most oppressive in the world with numbers of jailed journalists rising steadily each year. Growing internet censorship and new laws designed to make free expression a punishable offense. During the last two decades the ruling Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front has adopted increasingly severe methods for halting press coverage deemed critical of the party's actions. International radio frequencies are sporadically blocked for destabilizing propaganda, while outlets like Al Jazeera are accused of indirect support of terrorist groups for reporting on banned Ethiopian political organizations. 79 Ethiopian journalists have been driven into exile during the past decade, the highest number of any country in the world according to data from the committee to protect journalists they leave when their lives are threatened in anonymous anonymous letters when their publications are shuttered by the government or when yet another colleague is beaten and interrogated by the police but when alamu did not leave she did not stop reporting she moved from one job to another as the publications she worked for were forced to shut down as a columnist at fata Her colleagues say she received threatening phone calls telling her to stop her critical reporting. When she refused, she faced slander in government-controlled media. In the days before she was arrested, Alamu published investigative stories on the government's controversial funding of a dam project. She criticized late Prime Minister Melazenawis's intolerance of dissent, comparing his governance to Gaddafi's. She faced down critics and endured a lot of threats. Ultimately, the government used the 2009 anti-terrorism pro- proclamation to jail Elamu for her reporting, and under this law, anyone said to provide moral support to what the government calls terrorist groups, including opposition political parties and some independent media outlets faces up to 20 years in prison. Alamu is now in her second year of a 5-year sentence, branded as a messenger of terrorists. She is being kept at a notoriously ill-maintained prison on the outskirts of Addis Ababa, where rodents infest the cells and where prisoners of conscience share quarters with those convicted of violent crimes. Early in her prison term, Alamu was offered freedom in exchange for an admission of guilt and information about her journalistic colleagues. When she refused, she was put in solitary confinement for 2 weeks and was denied food and water. This year she was forced to undergo a painful operation to remove a tumor from her breast. She was given no recovery time. and no further treatment before being returned to prison. Her last appeal will be up before the highest court in Ethiopia in just a few days. She has exhausted other judicial options but plans to maintain her innocence until the very end. When asked to explain her motives for suffering so acutely for her freedom of journalism and expression, Alamu remembers a favorite quote by Schopenhauer. She says life is short but truth works far and lives long 
Let us speak the truth. ነው <laughs> منم نگر ماله في ما يشيل نجأ تحسر الله ونجلي نا نجري درس بيني على بلو زارين كم صافو ده هلا ما يل كزاري سبعتنا متوفيت رجت نوصل بيت عبرنا برن عبرنا تيازنا وده ما أكل يصير بيت إذا هو عند لي ركوزنا بركو ركوزهم هني على كم نبرة زاك جبوا شيء كاباركين ركوزهم هني ما وقتين سربيت وسترقص مهم بات أم كبارنا كسروا ولا بات أم تلك شكمنا دم التاج أو إسكندر هون أسرع من تام تفردني أنا هي هز على جعل مهالات شلاي كفونا دبكون يلاي أنا إسكندر دم يلوت على شيء زون دار قال فلك بالوال يلي جوم شن قال لات بات أم يتقود أنا دل جار اللي ميسبا ودل جار اللي ميجاوتهم كسانيو سكار بتمرت بيت يا سال لفال كدامي ناو دا باتو جا قالي تولال كذا سيملس كذا أنا توش قاتة جوست لو يلي جو أتا كم سكندرم بقى عن شيء المتدق فين كونا كجون هنا نمتي كونا عادر على بالش لجين كجون أجر عادر شلين بقى يعني نجر جزي ولي رزوم لا ترى من خلال الموت عبت لجينجن آدرا نيم متنيا تاقتوني على يمتى سيت أيك أن هو لي ساق كان مستقبله أم نستي بتدا جامي توب أسلامي كايدي سباي مبتغفا فا سلا جازيت أنيوش متاسر زاري وت إثالام التام نجا وت إثالام التام آدرلم وت إثالام التام برتو تأنكو توب على يالا شو تقولت؟ أهون ميكات الناملا ليلو شو ميتاسرون داس كنت رأينا في ليلو شو غازيت أنا مش لاي متارة قلت النجار يكات ال ترى تاتشن وتأت على ما تأمات بلو تسبات تقولت وتأت على ما تأل برتو ناملا According to the European Union, in its recent attempt to investigate the situation of prisoners, and particularly that of political prisoners and journalists, it was denied access by the government. As of August 2014, according to the CPJ, five independent magazines and a weekly newspaper have been charged by Ethiopia's Justice Ministry, a move that may add to the long lists of shuttered publications and Ethiopian journalists in exile. Fourteen journalists who have been working for these magazines have been forced into exile. Since its guerrilla days, the TPLF has wanted to control the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Once it got into power, it illegally removed the then presiding patriarch of the church and installed a Tigray patriarch. According to the Ethiopian Synod, a patriarch appointment was for life, and the TPLF trampled and installed a patriarch from its own ethnic group. With this blatant and ethnic deranged policy, the Ethiopian church split, creating two church administrations, one in Ethiopia and one in the diaspora. While many Ethiopians served the diaspora church, 
Many Tigray support the church in Ethiopia because of ethnic and political affinity. This division throughout the decades has been exacerbated by the Tigray government's targeting of the church and priests who are assumed to oppose the regime or question the government-created synod. <laughs> Amada priests particularly have been the targets of beatings, torture, arrests, and killings in the northern part of the country, Gondar. The millennium-old Waldaba Monastery is a case in point where Amada priests were blatantly told they had to leave the monastery because they were not Tigray and were not allowed to serve. This occurred because they were questioning a construction that would destroy part of the monastery. The man responsible for giving the orders for the priests to be ethnically cleansed, tortured and beaten was Abai Sahai. He was responsible for managing the so-called development in the area. Furthermore, the TPLF has been interfering with Ethiopian Muslims. Muslims have continued to protest the TPLF's interference in their religious right to worship and choose their leaders. The TPLF has made it clear that Ethiopian Muslims must accept the Al-Habish form of Islam and must accept the leaders it chooses for them. The government has continued to kill, harass, and imprison Muslims. The incident at Kofila took the lives of at least a dozen. Furthermore, on August 8, 2013, several Muslims were beaten by federal police for protesting. The arrest and torture of Muslims still continues to this day. Tens of thousands of Ethiopians have left their country due to religious and political persecution. These refugees take dangerous routes to leave for a better life. Tens of thousands have died over the years trying to make it to Europe over the Mediterranean Sea, and others take the Red Sea route to make it into the Middle East through Yemen, while still others go through Kenya and other Eastern African countries to get into South Africa. According to UNHCR, 103,000 Africans reached Yemen in 2011, and among them were 75,000 Ethiopians. Tens of thousands are leaving to go to neighboring Kenya as well. 83 Ethiopian nationals are being held at Buruburu police station for being in the country illegally. The suspects were arrested last evening at a house in phase 8. Police in Kitangela have arrested 25 aliens of Ethiopian origin who are found hiding in areas near Valley Estate. The 23 Ethiopian aliens were today brought before the Madaraka Law Courts. So they were arrested yesterday in Githurai. They have been fined 50,000 shillings each or one year in jail. According to VOA, 35,000 Ethiopians fleeing ethnic clashes moved into Kenya in 2012 alone. Moyale residents are hosting thousands of refugees from Ethiopia who are on the run following clashes that broke out last Thursday between two clans, the Burana and the Gari from southern Ethiopia after the Ethiopian government decided to settle the Gari community on land which the Burana community claims to be theirs. Thousands of refugees, most said to be from the Gari community, are now camped. Others are being hosted by the area residents. At least 12 people have been injured and two of them are nursing gunshot wounds at the Moyale nursing home. The response team of the Kenyan Red Cross Society Moyale branch says there could be more casualties yet to reach the Kenyan border from the Ethiopian interior where the fighting is taking place. 
The refugee crisis never ends, and every month tens of thousands of Ethiopians leave the country. In late 2013, more than 100,000 Ethiopian refugees were expelled from Saudi Arabia. During the crackdown, several thousand Ethiopians were killed or missing. Nearly 160,000 Ethiopian women went to work in the Saudi Kingdom in the year to July, a tenfold jump on the previous 12 months. The United Nations says tens of thousands more go illegally, lured by foreign wages, a means of supplementing their families' meager incomes. But for Zaini, the escape route out of poverty didn't go to plan. After three months, she returned home. She'd suffered beatings, was threatened with a knife, and was denied wages. First of all, it's important to know how reliant most Saudi households are on domestic workers. Almost every household has a woman from Indonesia, Ethiopia, the Philippines, living and working in their home. We've documented a range of abuses. It's very common that women are often working from morning till night, 16 to 18 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, many cases of unpaid wages, cases of forced confinement in the workplace, and in some cases, sexual and physical abuse. Bloomberg spoke to one Ethiopian woman who said she was raped repeatedly by her Saudi employer. Many are uninformed or undeterred by the potential risks, making Ethiopia an easy target for cheap labor. Some of the governments uh, from countries that send domestic workers to Saudi Arabia have started to complain. And we've seen that the most prominently from the Philippines and Indonesia, where they faced a lot of pressure from civil society at home, from very bad media coverage, um, asking them to protect the Filipino workers in Saudi Arabia, to protect the Indonesian women who are working in Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia hasn't liked this. So instead, they are starting to turn to countries that don't have strong labor protections, that don't have governments that are willing to speak out on behalf of their citizens' rights. And what we're starting to see are more domestic workers being recruited from countries like Ethiopia, Nepal, Bangladesh, Kenya. And these women are much less prepared and they have much less access to services and to help if they do face abuse. In Ethiopia, more than three-quarters of the population lives on less than two dollars a day. Lack of opportunity means that even teenagers migrate, despite the risks. Tens of thousands of farmers have been removed from their own land illegally to make way for foreign corporations. The Gambela people particularly have been victims of the regime under the guise of development. Much of the land on offer is in the region of Gambela, located in the southwest of Ethiopia. Details of the land deals with foreign investors are shrouded in secrecy. But of the 800,000 hectares of land made available for foreign investment in Gambela, some 650,000 hectares of deals have already been reported to the press. The greatest interest has been from Indian and Saudi investors, eager for cheap farmland to feed their growing populations. The drive behind land grabbing is not to feed the world, it's about to get control of land. It's, it's about making money. It's about privatization of land. It's about big investment companies, especially from the finance sector, uh, pension funds, uh, banks, who have come to realize after the financial crisis that uh, land is actually a good commodity to invest in. Meet the players in Gambela. Said and the Krishna Karaturi of Karaturi Global, the poster boy for the land grab in Ethiopia. Karaturi is a cut flower company from India with ambitions to become the world's leading food producer. Ethiopian Saudi tycoon billionaire Sheikh Mohammed Hussein al Ahmoudi of the Saudi Star Agricultural Development Company. He plans to develop more than 250,000 hectares of rice and other crops to export to Saudi Arabia as part of the Saudi Kingdom's food security initiative. Ruchi Soya one of India's largest edible oil companies, 
currently expanding into overseas soybean production with 50,000 hectares. Because of the food crisis, a number of countries who were totally dependent on imports, but having a lot of cash, such as the Gulf states, realized that they couldn't rely on the market anymore. The Confederation of Potato Seed Farmers, a group of large-scale Punjabi potato farmers from India, acquiring land overseas to produce for export to India, 50,000 hectares. Large tracts of land have also been given to Ethiopian investors coming from other parts of the country. Yet while the government claims the areas leased out to foreign companies are wastelands that are not being used, the government and investors stress that the relocation of tens of thousands of people in rural areas has been voluntary and that it's been carried out to improve their way of life. In reality, however, the government has been forcefully removing them to give away their land to investors. The farmers have not been compensated whatsoever and have become homeless. The identities of those interviewed have been disguised for their own safety. There is strong local opposition to the land grab, yet the communities live in fear that their resistance will be violently repressed by the government. Those who speak out against government policy in Gambela are regularly subjected to harassment, intimidation, imprisonment and personal injury, such as the people you see in the photos. Local sources report that several opponents of the current land deals have been imprisoned, with reports of one person having been killed. According to Human Rights Watch, the TPLF government has refused to be investigated by the World Bank on the issue of illegal displacements and ethnic cleansing of farmers for profit. According to the International Food Policy Research Institute, its recent study on Ethiopia shows a deliberate and systematical monopolization of the country's farmland resources. The Tigray region disproportionately gets the lion's share, several times more than needed for its population size. The Ethiopian military and intelligence are controlled and are being run by a single ethnic group. Almost all of the high-ranking generals and officials are from the Tigray ethnic group. One study looked into the ethnic composition of the military officials of past regimes, such as Derg and Haile Selassie I, and compared and contrasted them with the current regime. The findings concluded that while the past two regimes were very representative of various ethnic groups within the military brass positions, the current military is practically made up of a single ethnic group comprising 95% of the top military leadership positions. They effectively dominate every aspect of the military, while the population of the Tigray ethnic group is only 6% of the country. According to the Global Integrity Report, the judiciary system has long been plagued with corruption and unjust rules imposed on it by the TPLF governments. Judges do not rule based on the law and its system, but based on political affinity, interest, profits, and intimidation from TPLF officials. The Global Integrity Report classifies Ethiopia's judiciary as being very weak. 
The judiciary is simply an appendage of the ruling party that exercises exclusive control over its budget to manipulate the administration of courts. The appointment, training, promotion, transfer, discipline, and tenure of judges and prosecutors are subject to heavy-handed manipulation by the regime to subvert the legal system to serve the political and economic interests of those in power. Thus, what are the U.S. interests? It's evident that the United States' primary concern with Ethiopia is stability and fighting the terrorist group Al-Shabaab and other possible terrorist groups that could potentially take root in the Horn of Africa. To protect this interest, the United States has continued to deliberately ignore gross human rights violations in Ethiopia. In fact, instead of condemning and taking any meaningful action toward the government, the United States has actually supported the Tigray government financially and politically, despite its full knowledge that the Tigray government has been carrying out genocide. In fact, it has a military base within Ethiopia where soldiers are trained to carry out the government's atrocities. The relevant question, however, is how long can the United States keep using its interest as an excuse to deliberately ignore human rights? Ethiopia today is at a crossroad, and the future of the country is ever looking bleak. As repeatedly emphasized earlier, we're heading to a fully-fledged failed state resembling that of Somalia, Syria, and Iraq. This is because the tension and conflict within Ethiopia have reached a boiling point where a simple spark could instigate chaos. Conflict and tension revolving around ethnicity, religion, and politics are very high. This is because the Tigray government, since its inception, has made sure to destroy the very fabric of Ethiopian society, which was based on religious and ethnic tolerance and understanding. This old Ethiopian tolerance and understanding has become eroded to the point where it is now non-existent. There is no balance. The present Ethiopia is rife with hate rhetoric and ideology, especially among the major groups. There is inter-religious tension, as well as tension between religious groups themselves. Additionally, there are at least 100 political parties and over 30 groups armed to the teeth, almost all of them identifying themselves with a particular ethnic group, religion, political party, or ideology. On top of all this, as outlined above, the Tigray government has made sure to implement ethnocracy, where people of its ethnic group benefit in all sectors of the country. This type of system is reminiscent of Rwanda and Yugoslavia, where the dominance of a particular ethnic group led to a disastrous result that ended in genocide and civil war. The question of Ethiopia disintegrating is a matter of what will spark the tension. The disintegration of Ethiopia will denote the disintegration of the Horn of Africa. The Horn will be extremely destabilized. It'll be a cesspool of religious and ethnic conflicts, not to mention terrorist groups that will be able to function freely. The pertinent question to Western countries, and particularly the United States, is what type of future are they looking for when it comes to Ethiopia and the Horn at large? The way we see it, they have two options. One, to continue supporting the tyrannical Tigray government and gamble that it will not bring perpetual civil war and genocide to the Horn. Or two, to radically democratize Ethiopia without any gaps or preconditions attached. These two options can be further explained in terms of U.S. interests. With the first option, the United States can continue supporting the murderous Tigray government in order to protect its short-term interest. While this position might seem appealing for a while, it also violates the American ideals of democracy, freedom, and justice because it is essentially supporting a tyrannical government. The second option is that the United States can guarantee its long-term interest by democratizing Ethiopia immediately and denying the Tigray government mechanisms of oppressions. Should the United States choose option number one, Ethiopia's disintegration will not only cause regional instability, it will also become a breeding ground for terrorists because the instability will be conducive for terrorist groups to operate freely. The United States has no option but to confront the TPLF government in order to preserve its future interests. 
For the past 20 years, the Tigray government has led Ethiopia into a social, economic, and religious disaster. The United States continues to support the tyrannical government, knowing the eventuality of its demise. Neighboring countries such as Somalia and South Sudan are already unstable and plagued with ethnic and religious wars. Further to the west, Central Africa is also battling religious and ethnic wars. In Nigeria, the Boko Haram is wreaking havoc and a plethora of social and economic problems is brewing. What the United States must understand is that Ethiopia is a country with an estimated population of 90 million and with such a number, the potential for civil wars and genocides is very high. Therefore, the U.S. must change its policy and implement meaningful actions toward the government. The implementation process must be a rigid one. If anything substantial is to be reached, the implementation process the United States intends to take must be a stringent one. It must be an action plan that shows the TPLF government that it means business. The usual or casual diplomatic approach of reprimanding and offering empty, baseless statements will not cut it. Western countries, and particularly the United States, have always offered lip service disregarding the atrocities carried out by the Tigray government. Therefore, not only a strong message must be sent, but it must also be tangibly implemented. The TPLF has repeatedly shown its unwillingness to cooperate with any authority. Various organizations such as the European Union, World Bank, Human Rights Watch, and many others have attempted to persuade the Tigray government to cooperate, but to no avail. Therefore, the United States must send a stronger message than any that the World Bank, EU, and Human Rights Watch communicated. There must be a precondition that the United States must set first. First, Western countries must cease any sort of financial aid to Ethiopia. Secondly, the United States must investigate ethnic cleansings of the Amara people from the south, southwestern, and eastern parts of the country. Third, the United States must investigate the Amara, Gambela, or Anuak, and Ogaden genocides. These three are specific genocides that have been carried out. Fourth, all political prisoners and journalists should be released immediately without any precondition and must regain their respective media outlets. In addition, independent media should be given the freedom to function independently without the TPLF interfering with and intimidating them. 5. The TPLF government must stop interfering in religious groups and respect the Constitution. The Ethiopian refugee crisis should be recognized and be accepted by the United States. 6. Land giveaways to the foreign investors at the expense of farmers through ethnic cleansing, abuse, and allocation must cease right away, and an investigation must be pursued. 7. The Ethiopian military must be representative and not comprised of a single ethnic group. And 8. Ethiopia's judiciary must be free from government control, and its rulings must be final. The TPLF government must not only show promise, but it must show the implementation of the adjustment of all these issues. Thus, the United States should give the TPLF government six months to a year in which it should show tangible change on the issues discussed above. During the six-month period, the United States should keep its distance and scrutinize activities to ensure that the preconditions are being met. If the Tigray government does not show efforts toward making any of the proposed changes, the United States must levy the following sanctions. TPLF officials involved in the above-mentioned genocides, ethnic cleansings, and war crimes should be targets of the following. 1. Levying of economic sanctions. 2. Freezing of the assets of TPLF officials. 3. Instituting a travel ban on TPLF officials. 4 cutting diplomatic ties, and five, cutting financial aid. In summary, these implementations are feasible and well within the power of the U.S. government. It must understand that a radical democratization is key here because the U.S. does not have the luxury because time is of the essence. 
Meager statements and bogus discussions and ineffective policies or sanctions are not going to cut it. The casual statement, we are deeply concerned, makes a mockery of U.S. ideals and the position it professes to stand for. Presently, the Swedish international criminal investigators have set out grounds to prosecute top Ethiopian government officials to the ICC. This is an effort that should be applauded, and the United States should follow Sweden's example. Should the U.S. continue its silence, history will judge its policies of inaction and indifference in the face of great injustice carried out on the Ethiopian people.